very welcome on stage, Hubertus Besau. First of all, sorry, PayPal. Um, I was invited by Klarna, so <laughs> I put that into place. Um, thank you very much for, for having me today. Um, I'll tell you something about um, something you don't know yet, and that is my muesli and the story of my muesli. So, um, as I was introduced, I didn't found by my own, but together with two friends, student friends, uh, Phil and Max. Um, Max was the only one of us studying law. Phil and me were studying business administration, so what we had in common was studying at a lower Bavarian small city called Passau, and we didn't have any idea about food, about e-commerce, about marketing, and especially not uh, how to produce food in Germany. But we were about to find out. Um, when we went uh, to a swimming lake in summer 2005, um, that very lake you see at the picture here, uh, we had the first initial idea of uh, what we wanted to do because we all agreed that we didn't want to become consultants or bankers like all our co-students. Uh, but instead, we listened to, to a radio commercial on the car and that was for Muesli. And it was so awful and so bad that we thought, okay, if those guys can sell only one Muesli with that spot, uh, we can do better. And on the way back from the lake, we bumped into the first supermarket um, at the road to, to get a kind of market overview. And what we experienced was huge shelves, uh, shelves aisles after aisles, fully packed with muesli, cereals, and all that stuff you could imagine. So we were a bit disappointed, because where can you position yourself if you have like a really saturated market? And um, we, we gave that a sword and were really sad because our first idea of not becoming a banker seemed to not become reality. So, with that disappointment in mind, we thought, okay, let's take the best muesli we can find for our flat uh, and buy that and eat that tomorrow at least um, and have a few beers later. So we went through those aisles looking for the perfect muesli for our shared flat. But we didn't end up with one. That was not the one we were looking for. Max didn't like nuts, Philip hates raisins, and I wanted Caesar in it. So we ended up with three different mueslis, and um, with none of it, we were satisfied at all. It was not what it looked like when you look at the picture um, of the box when you have it in your bowl. It's, it was a complete difference. We even have a word for that in German. Um, if something is called Serviervorschlag on the front packaging, it means it's, it's more or less a promise that what you get from the packaging won't look any like what the picture looks, right? So we, th we thought, we are not the only one, maybe, not finding the perfect muesli. And this is when our um, idea to my muesli really kicked in. But to verify that, that we are not the only ones, we had to do some market research. As good business students, uh, you do survey. And we sent out a survey to about 150 friends, basically asking, would you buy muesli online? And that was in 2008. In 2008, e-commerce was really, really small. And the answer we got from nearly all was, no, maybe it's cheaper. If it's cheaper, then I would buy online. That's a very typical German answer. <laughs> However, um, over the course of time, we fell in love with the idea of my muesli, and we just had to try it anyway. First was a fail, a fail with the questionnaire, but we had to try it anyway. And um, during our last year at university, um, all of us worked secretly on, on the perfect muesli mixture, and um, Philip was ordering ingredients, trying it out, Max was sorting out the market and communications, and I did one of my biggest mistakes in life, I programmed the whole website, uh, not being a programmer, but I'll come to that in a minute. In April 2007, we launched this website. It looked very similar like, like today. And uh, as I said, I spent like six months of my life programming this website. And we went online on 30th of April. 
after promising all our friends, yes, yes, it takes a long time, but um, we'll be up and running in April. So it was the last night um, of April, when at 5 o'clock in the morning, when we went online, working in a row for three days and nights, sorting out the last errors. And we were about to fall into our beds. Um, and I heard this noise from my bed, going like pling, pling, pling. I was wondering, oh my god, there's another mistake. I have to correct, it's, it's a major bug. Um, because this pling only sounded um, when we got an order. And at 5 o'clock in the morning, even I knew it was not possible that so many people would be ordering our muesli. For what reason should they do that? And I went back to the computer, really, really tired, and found out, oh, these are actual orders. So within the first hour, between 5 and 6 o'clock in the morning, we get the first, the first dozen of orders. How did that happen? Well, we, when we started, we sent out um, 150 emails to all our blogger friends saying, you can mix your custom muesli from 80 organic ingredients, giving you 566 quadrillion possible um, mueslis. Well, the pricing um, but seemed not to be a point because our delivery fee was 390 euros, which is the average price for a muesli at the supermarket. And those tubes were around seven or eight euro each. But still people were ordering. They just wanted their individual personal muesli. And every muesli was different. Every one we mixed was different. And it couldn't be uh, in a packaging that was uh, like all the other packages. We wanted to be different in every aspect. So we go for tubes, and still do today, instead of boxes or bags. Um, and we don't show muesli at all on the packaging, because we know it won't look like in your bowl later on. So the first 100 emails we sent out to blogger friends led to more than 400 blog posts. And uh, if, you, if you take your head back in time, uh, that was a pre-Facebook era. There was no social media except blogs. There was no Twitter. There was nothing, only blogs. But the blogs really scared those old media guys. This is why all the old media guys were reading blogs. They were much faster, and their audience was growing quicker than the average reader number of, of newspapers. So the old media picked up the story, as Google did, because Google was reading blogs, catapulting us um, as a number one key result for, for the search term muesli within one week. And that led to a lot of more buzz. So nearly every German TV station was visiting us in our workshop. And you can see here a picture of our 2007 workshop. And if, you lead, if I lead you from left to right through our workshop, you will see on the far left, uh, this is our warehouse. You know, the packaging, the, the brown ones, this is where we store the ingredients. Then a bit further to the right, you see all the ingredients about to being used by Philip who was a bit ahead of his time with this fashion, a monochromous um, white outfit, and the production area in front of him. Even the screen was fake for the pictures, because those times we, we printed out all the emails containing the recipes, and Philip would mix it by hand. Um, where you see this guy on the right side, this is where all the parcels had been packed. So it was 35 square meters of room, where we produced a lot of muesli, day and night, being three founders only. So, what happened then? All that buzz led to many, many orders, and orders, printed orders, were piling up at our production facility. However, that couldn't go well for long, because after 14 days we were completely sold out. The only problem was we noticed that four weeks later, because things were piling up, and um, we had to tell a lot of customers, well, the muesli you ordered two weeks ago, we can't deliver, because um, we were sold out. We didn't have any software to check um, how many tubes and packagings and ingredients we had. So we called our supplier, saying, like, things are going quite well. Uh, we need another, uh, we need to order more tubes. Can you send them tomorrow? 
And he was going like, well, you're lucky there's only one other customer. I produce the tubes um, before, uh, before I can deliver to you, but that customer is a German discounter, and um, my machines are booked for the next six weeks. We're going, what, six weeks? Um, we can't tell our customers to wait six, week, six weeks, but we didn't find another way. Um, and we had to tell them. So we wrote dozens of emails, hundreds of emails, sending them out. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You'll have to wait for your breakfast for more than six weeks now, which was really not what we intended. Um, and to, to scare off customers from our website, which, which was seeing quite, quite a lot of traffic those days, um, we put up that banner, sold out. You can order, but if you order, be aware, you'll be waiting more than six weeks. And I estimated that all the orders will go down to zero, because who wants to order a custom mix muesli and wait six weeks until you can try it, right? Um, that was not the case. For some reason, all this happened in the first six weeks, between May and Ju uh, June. And this is actually the number of muesli friends, how we call our customers, because um, all customers are friends and muesli lovers as we are. They're not called customers. This graph shows you the growth of, um, of our customers, or muesli friends. And it's really funny if you look at it. It looks um, like an exponential growth, and it's actual numbers. It's not like made up from a business plan. However, it led to some problems looking like this. <laughs> uh, this is the first level of, um, of our production facilities, and also where um, the logistic company uh, picked up the parcels. But as you can see behind Max there, there's a staircase. And that was a major problem because not only that we had to carry all the ingredients upstairs, we also had to carry down all the parcels every day. That was saving us uh, on gym fee. Um, but still, it was not the optimal way of doing logistics, we learned. So demand grew and, um, well, we needed some help. So we needed automatization. I mean, I, I skipped a couple of years now, um, a lot of helping hands. Um, but we ended up with this machine, which is um, still in place today. And it's capable of mixing from over 80 ingredients, those 566 quadrillion possible mueslis. And if you're a German, you think, well, Germans, they can do automatization and all that stuff. So I went from one fair to the next fair, explaining our problem. We have 80 ingredients. And we want to produ produce muesli, it has to be filled in this tube, and everyone, every single one is different. And they were all looking at me like, no, I can, I can produce 500 billion mueslis per whatsoever month, but they will all be the same. I said, no, that's not quite what we like to have. Whatever, I met a friend um, who specialized in automatization, and um, he accompanied me to all those fairs, and he said, okay, if we don't find anyone who can do that for you, I'll build it. And I said, okay, that's a deal. So we didn't find anyone. He had to build it. And it took only one and a half years for, for him and us uh, to come up with this uh, machine. And uh, I'll show you in a minute how it's moving. But um, for the second now, if you look at 58, 59, those are containers per ingredients. We have one of those stations. And um, the good thing was, when you build a prototype machine first, you will have lots of errors, a lot of, lots of mistakes. But we only built one of those stations, six prototypes. And when it was perfect, we could just replicate this um, sixth version of it. So we built 80 machines of it for all the ingredients. And I'll show you in a second how it works. Um, our tubes contain a 2D barcode containing the recipe of the muesli. And the tube goes from one station to the next one, being scanned on every station. And the station will, will ask uh, the recipe, OK, am I in that mix or not? And if, how much? And then the tube is passed on to the next station, which uh, is really good, because if you add more ingredients, you can just add more stations and prolong the whole machinery. Uh, we are a bit lucky, because um, well, everything gets, gets more expensive when you, when you build machinery stuff. Uh, the price for stainless steel declined. And uh, because it was a friend, that was really a major impact on the price. And we could finally afford that. I'll show you a video where we installed the, the machinery. It's really a huge monster. It's 45 meters of, of stainless steel. 
and uh, this is still where we produce today. Uh, it's a little city called Passau and uh, we have a workshop there. Um, this machinery produces all of our custom mixes. I come later to what we have uh, in, to offer more than custom mixes. But this is how, how my muesli started and it's still a big part of um, what we sell. It's, um, for online shoppers it's about one third of all the orders uh, that are custom mixes. And um, yeah, we, we add new ingredients from time to time. Um, most of the new customers um, come for the custom mixes to my muesli and uh, most become loyal customers as well. So if you have the chance to, to come to southern Germany, near Munich, uh, drop by, I'll give you a tour uh, if you want to see it yourself. What you've also seen at the last picture was um, different colored tubes, um, because the custom mixed tubes are only white. And what I have in front of me is one of the non-custom mixed mueslis. Um, I'll come to you in a second, and how we ended up there. Because only 566 fragilium mueslis, that was not enough for us, right? We had to do more. And we had a lot of data we were sitting on, and that was quite interesting, because in order to optimize production processes, we looked at all those data and thought, yeah, maybe, maybe they are not mixing their own custom mixes. Maybe we can prepare like five different pre-versions and then just add one or two ingredients, and then we can serve all those customers with their, uh, what they think are personal mueslis. Well, we had a deep look into our data and what we experienced after analyzing a sample of 100,000 orders was that only 42 mixtures were identical by chance. And so we were quite disappointed again because we couldn't optimize our production, right? However, um, this, this fact somehow showed that the initial idea of custom mixes had a relevance and um, people were demanding individual mueslis. So on this shot, you can see um, what has been mixed with what. So uh, the, the bigger the line is, um, the more often these ingredients had been combined. And the bigger the icon of, uh, of the ingredients is, uh, the, the higher the absolute number in that sample. So um, you see here all the fruits um, and strawberries and raspberries being the most favorite ones. And you can also see with what uh, other ingredients they had been combined. And that was a great, great thing to, to develop new mueslis because customers were asking, um, what goes along with what? I have fixed, does it uh, work with bananas or does it work uh, with certain nuts? And um, we, did, we did another mistake in the beginning we, because we said all our muesli friends can call us any time because we, <laughs> we, we do such a great customer service and we put our mobile phone numbers on the website. The only problem was that people actually used that. <laughs> and so after mixing muesli for, I don't know, hours and hours, um, three, three o'clock in the night, our phones would ring like, well, I'm just mixing a muesli right now. Um, pears, goji berries, and do you think figs would fit? Uh, that, that was a bit tiring. <laughs> um, however, um, for all those who were not sure about what they liked or not, or they trusted more in us in doing so, this data was really like the holy grail. And we ended up with a um, good range of pre-mixes. One of them is this one. And you can try other ones outside. Um, the good thing about those mixes was um, that we could introduce them into offline channels as well. And uh, while in, in the food business you usually only have a success rate of 10% for new introductions, we had a success rate of 90% because we used the data to generate the muesli mixes um, and nutritional expertise. And we could also pre-test it um, with our customers. So that's a big range. This is a Stockholm limited edition. Um, you can find out more about that in our store. I, I'll come to that in a minute, or outside. We also have um, one portion servings, um, little cups where you can pour milk on and spoon directly from it. But I won't go into detail. My muesli went offline two years after the launch. Um, not literally, but 
in a way, uh, you can experience now in Stockholm at Master Samos Guitar. We opened up many, many stores. The first one was only meant for us and our employees to have a meeting point in Passau to have a decent coffee. But we opened more stores in Munich and in Regensburg and in Cologne and Nuremberg and Stuttgart. Today we have, no, not 44 stores, we opened two more today. So it's 46 stores across Europe, most of them in Germany, Austria and Switzerland, and two of them in Sweden, one in Marcel Samos, Gatan, and one uh, at Tabby Centrum. So we don't do a franchise, we want to be in direct contact uh, with the customers. And I really urge you to go to the uh, Stockholm uh, store and find out what your favorite muesli mixture is. It's a really nice store and you can try everything, so don't hesitate to go there. That's what it looks like. A bit over time already, so I'll jump through the last slides. Um, in Germany, you can also find us at different supermarkets. Um, that won't be the case in Sweden for the next 12 months, probably, but um, we're working on that. That's one of the shelves of, of a guy who really liked us and swiped away all the other mueslis from his shelf. So after nine years, um, we're still selling 566 quadrillion muesli variants, um, have 80 premixes, we have more than 700 employees right now, two production facilities, five different brands. You can see our coffee brand, our tea brand, and our juice brand uh, on the right side because we got a bit bored uh, having no one uh, pointing us to, to focus down. So uh, we completely bootstrap without um, venture capital and stuff for eight years. And we're active in six countries. And now? We won't stop until we sold every possible mix at least once. And we really, really need your help in doing so in Sweden. So if you see me around or someone with a muesli hoodie around here, don't hesitate to talk to us. I think we'll find a way to cooperate and provide you with some of the best muesli mixtures, your individual muesli. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions from you? Can? Any questions from you? Can? Yeah, can I have a look at that muesli? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There's more outside. <laughs> I, it's more outside for you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, Bertus, and thank you for the muesli, and welcome to Sweden. Thank you for say. having me. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks.